I would like to start just briefly talk about the objective of these webinars. These are meant um, to be to give a brief introduction to the various pieces of the guideline, the policy guidance and each of the technical modules, to just make the users and readers familiar with the content of the guidelines, because this is a very large document, about 200 pages in total, and many different independent pieces. So these webinars are only supposed to basically act as a teaser and encourage the users to, to spend time throughout the next weeks and months read different pieces of it. We are recording all of the, um, all four of the webinars um, and we will make them available. The pieces that are presented, the agenda is slightly different among the four, uh, four different webinars. So the agenda of today's webinar, I will continue with some background, basic concepts that has been the basis of the development of the guidelines, and brief introduction to the main recommendations of part one. Then my colleague, Ruud Hudik, he will continue with introducing 10 enabling elements for a successful national disaster risk assessment. These are also from the part one of the guideline. Then we'll have a presentation on data management which Vivian Depardé from GFDRR, he will, he will be the presenter. Then this next presentation will be on marginalized and minority groups considerations in a national disaster risk assessment by Kevin Blanchard from DRR Dynamics. After that, Mariam Golnaragi from Geneva Association will present on developing risk assessments to support sovereign risk financing and risk transfer followed by a session on sea level rise hazard and risk assessment by Rebecca Beavers from U.S. National Park Services. And at the end, um, we'll have a presentation on NAPEX hazard and risk assessment by Sir Gerfin from Joint Research Center, JRC. So, what I'm going to present is mostly from part one of the guideline. But I would like to start with introducing um, just some backgrounds about the guideline. The board started with an open call for experts to join the working group in mid-2015. The actual started in 2016. And right from the beginning, we wanted to develop a guideline that basically makes the concepts of risk assessment, which is sorry, which is quite a technical topic, make it available to DRR practitioners who are actual who are the actual users of the outputs of risk assessment. So we followed very we followed the basically rule of ensuring every concept, including the very technical and complex concepts, are presented in a simple and clear language. The guideline has three parts. All parts and pieces have been peer reviewed, and in total, throughout the one throughout one year and a half, about 120 experts from 70 institutions have been contributing as authors, advisors, or peer reviewers. There are two country cases right now from UK and New Zealand included in the guideline. The final version was released about two and a half weeks ago on October 13th, 2017, on the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. There is a web platform online available with all pieces and modules. And the idea is that the new technical modules, new topics, and country cases will be added over time to that web page. Part one is a policy guidance on good approaches in design and implementation of risk assessment. Part two, consists of right now 12 independent modules on special topics which should be considered in any risk assessment depending on the context and objectives of a risk assessment. Part three is also in the format of independent modules and it's focused on various different hazards. Right now there are nine hazards covered and published. So I would like to encourage the users, readers to to spend time to look at various topics. As I said, each of these modules have been 
written independently, so it can be read separately. There is no need to read them in a continuous order. They're all independent. And, uh, and they're written in very simple language to communicate the basics of the concepts on each of these topics, but they all have, at the end of their module, a set of resources and references to guide the user to other references besides these guidelines to have access to deeper, longer, more comprehensive, or more technical references and guidelines on each of these topics. So the basic concepts that, have, that, that we have used as the base of the design and development of the guidelines. The components of disaster risk. The classic components, especially um, the terminology that is used in DRR community and insurance community, are hazard exposure and vulnerability. But Sendai framework have put forward the concept uh, and the component of coping capacity, rightfully, as the capacity, coping capacity or DRR capacity, plays a significant role in the level of risk and the level of impact. Coping capacity can be defined in different ways, can be understood and analyzed in different ways, but in a way, it's a flip side of vulnerability and the interaction, the complex interaction between these components um, basically creates risk. But there are also underlying drivers that influence each of these components and as a result influence the risk levels. Also, the impact can be both direct and indirect. So the combination of all of these basically in say seven components um, have been the basis of the thinking and the approach that we have used in developing the guidelines. As you know, Sendai Framework has put understanding disaster risk as the first priority for action. It also recommends using a wide range of different DRR measures, such as economic, structural, legal, social, health, cultural, educational, and other. But it recommends in a very nice, comprehensive way, it outlines and recommends the community, the stakeholders, to use different measures to reduce disaster risk in three categories or in three ways. First, by preventing creation of new disaster risk. This is basically the concept of resilient or sustainable development. Ensuring new development considers the hazards and risk issues and doesn't lead into creating new risk. The second category is reducing existing disaster risk. These are measures that are focused on reducing um, the vulnerability or the risk and the risk that already exists, such as using retrofitting measures or building new flooding dikes. And the third is managing residual risk. As we know, no matter what, we will not be able to completely eliminate disaster risk and there should be measures focused on managing residual risk. Measures such as emergency response planning and preparedness, recovery, build back better, and risk financing and insurance. But what is impor important is that all of these measures would require risk information. They need to know what the problem is in order to find a solution to manage that problem. And risk assessment provides that, that information, that knowledge, um, that intelligence to, to design and implement these measures leading, into, leading to reducing risk. But another thing that has been the basis of our guidelines is an observed challenge in understanding risk. Through um, review of progress during HFA and a lot of feedback from um, existing and ongoing risk assessment and their use of information. What is observed is that although there has been significant progress in science and technology and data collection and data management in producing risk information, but there is still not enough progress in using the results and using risk information effectively in decision making by stakeholders. So we also put this challenge on the table and as, as basically the main focus of our guidelines to look into good practices, to find and basically identify good approaches 
that have managed to tackle this challenge. And try to answer the question of then what is a successful risk assessment? What have been the quality and characteristics of good risk assessments that have actually managed to tackle the challenge that I just that I just explained? A successful risk assessment provides the intended users, and this is a key word, the intended users, with information about the risk that they are exposed to, the information that they are exposed to, with clear understanding of its characteristics and complexities, and empowers them in their decisions, functions, and operations to manage that risk. So it's actionable. It's not only information. It also empowers the users to take action and make decisions. This means the outputs are accessible, understandable, usable, and relevant. And the process of conducting risk assessment creates the ownership, understanding, and trust by the users. The main recommendations, based on that background, there are two main recommendations. Um, mostly presented in the part one of the guideline, but they are supported throughout all the different modules in different aspects of it. The first, establishing national and local systems for risk assessment that is integrated into policy and investment planning and process. These systems should be owned and managed by national and local governments, are sustainable and evolved in the long term, and has functional and multi-sectoral governance mechanism, and is a repository of all publicly available risk information. The second recommendation is to use a holistic approach to empower risk reduction decisions by looking at the linkage between all the different components. Next presentation will be focused in introducing 10 elements related to the first recommendation. Here I'm going to spend a few more minutes to just basically unpack the concept of holistic approach. The idea is to go beyond the classical um, components of, of risk assessment, hazard exposure and vulnerability, but also look into the underlying disaster risk drivers and capacities that actually influence each of these components. For example, in a classical um, risk assessment in education sector focused on physical risk. The result may be vulnerability levels, risk level, loss level in education sector, the number of schools, the amount of loss, the top most vulnerable schools may be the output of the risk assessment. But in a holistic approach, the risk assessment would also look into what has caused those vulnerabilities, what has been the source of creating that risk and identify, for example, low capacity in governance, low capacity in enforcing building codes in education sector, or not having, not monitoring the quality of construction, process and construction material has led into vulnerability of these schools and risk level. The other aspect is the impact, looking both at direct and indirect impact. So again, going back to the school case, looking into going beyond, for example, the physical or immediate loss, but also looking into longer term number of days or months or years that the children would be out of school, would be missing school, and the impact it may have on the longer term. Or in the case of in loss of um, head of a family, and how, because of that, many children may need to drop out of school uh, to support the family by, by working and not going to school, and looking into the longer-term cultural, education, economic impact, or on poverty level, for example, from such phenomena. This gives a more comprehensive picture and puts a more complete value of the loss by including both direct and indirect, and of course gives the in a sense, makes the argument of investing in reducing the risk stronger. So, the idea of doing a risk assessment 
and especially doing it holistic, is that it empowers disaster risk management measures and decision making. So going back to, the, to our example, having the holistic approach or having the classic approach would have led to investing in just retrofitting schools, but having holistic approach that has identified sources of risk, not having building code or not enforcing, not having capacity to enforce the building code, would make the decision makers to decide to maybe split their investment between investing in, in enhancing their capacity to enforce and monitor um, use and, and enforcement of building codes in building schools and putting another part in retrofitting the most vulnerable schools. So the holistic approach would bring more intelligence and empower the process of disaster risk reduction, decision making, and selection of measures. The last point, basically the concluding note, is that understanding disaster risk is an ongoing process. We have observed in good practices with country cases um, that have been doing national risk risk assessment and have managed to actually get the information to be used in by various sectors, we have seen that it has been a decade process. Many of these countries have started 10, 12, 13 years ago with small initiatives and gradually they have improved their system, their mechanism, and their process of conducting risk assessment, enhancing, adding hazards, engaging with more stakeholders, and gradually together improving their understanding of risk. It requires long-term commitment and engagement, collaboration among all stakeholders, both technical and the policymakers, decision makers, and general public throughout the process of risk decision.